Welcome into another edition of Bears All Access. It's brought to you by IGS Energy. Wishing you a great Friday night. Hope everything's going well and you enjoy your weekend. With a broadcast partner from News Radio 780, 105.9 FM, WBBM, Chicago Bears Super Bowl winner, Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak. We're previewing the Bears Week 4 matchup against the Giants in Jersey Sunday. Our broadcast on WBBM gets underway at 9, kickoff at noon. Coming up with the show, veteran offensive lineman Lucas Patrick joins the program and we also hear from the voice of the New York Giants, Bob Papa. Thanks to our producers, Dan Brilli and Jordan Treadup, and the folks at The Score. Tom, how you feeling? I'm feeling good, Jeff. You know, it's kind of crazy how your expectations change in week four from the beginning of the season. And even though the Bears are suffering through some growing pains in their passing game, now the expectations of what you can do going into New York. Can you go toe-to-toe with these guys? And then can you come out with a win? And I think all of those things are doable, but I guess that's the anticipation of the week leading up to the game. Well, we know what the Bears are, and they are not going to change in that regard. Uh, from an offensive perspective, we're going to focus on that in this segment, Tommy. Uh, offensive coordinator Luke Getze uh, described it to the T. They are a physical-based rushing offense. From the very beginning, when we walked in in training camp, we made it the focus of, what we, of who we wanted to be and the way we wanted to play the game. And uh, they have taken that by the reins for sure. And our play style reflects that, the way they're, if they're firing off the football, the way they're finishing, um, all that stuff. That's, that, is, that was the, the number one thing we, we said we were going to do. We wanted our tape to look a certain way. And uh, those guys have definitely accepted that challenge and done, and done a really nice job. So he wants the tape to look a certain way, wanted to set the tone with that from day one. You watch the tape as much as anybody. Has, has that been a mission accomplished in terms of the running game? Yeah, but the thing that's impressed me about it is this is not just an exclusive outside zone running team. They have interior vision by the running backs and they have nice, solid physical performances by the guards in the center to keep that interior running game open, being effective and being profitable. And a big part of it is the fullback. It is Kari Blassing game. He hasn't played much, 15 snaps last week, 13 the week before, 11 before that. But, Tommy, the production has been outstanding. This is from the Bears Coaches Show with Matt Eberflus on Monday night. And that's such an important thing on early downs to have that fullback in there. Um, and it changes, you know, if you're in 22 personnel or 21 personnel and you have that guy in there, it, it's it's a big adjustment for the defense. And you have to really work on those run fits because not every team carries a fullback, you know. So, you know, only a few teams do, you know, and more and more are starting to go back to it. But, man, when you have that weapon as a fullback, it creates a lot of situations for the, for the defense to handle. Tom, I know you love it. I, I know you'd probably like to see more. Make the defense match up against you. The fullback is not a revelation. It makes it more challenging nowadays because, you know, Jeff, back in the day when you had your Matt Sueys and you had your Calvin Thomases and you had your Brad Musters part of the fullback family of the Chicago Bears, you're talking about linebackers that were 250 pounds at the point of attack. Now you're talking about interior linebackers that are 220 pounds. You get a fullback that's 235 pound plus with a running start, that's a winnable battle. And you get that winnable battle, and it means positive interior rushing yards. So I understand the creativity of all the boy geniuses around the league, but what's the basic football fundamental? Physical interior presence, and that's because of a fullback. And I tell you, they've gotten some really good yards before first contact. So you got to give the guys up front, the receivers, the tight ends, the backs, all doing their part in this rushing attack that produced 281 against Houston. Luke Getze, Tommy thrilled with the performance of Khalil Herbert, just what he brings to the table. Not certain what David Montgomery's status will be for Sunday, but he had to leave the game after 11 plays with that lower leg injury. Khalil's got a really cool patience about him that he's able to kind of let things happen and make it feel like he's not necessarily going full speed, but he is, uh, which then allows him to make cuts, you know, and, and, and read off the blocks of guys pretty, really well. But what was real, to me what stood out this game compared to the other ones was his ability to make the first defender miss. Whether it was a stiff arm, whether it was running through a tackle, or whether it was a make and miss move, I think that was, a real, that was the biggest improvement this week. Well, he's a racked up dude as well. Uh, he has great <laughs> leverage, Tommy, and he just he gets north and south in a big hurry. Yeah, but you know, Jeff, when a, a new offensive coordinator comes aboard, you really don't know what your personnel can deliver for you until you get into the regular season. Running backs are rarely tackled in practice. You really don't get 
the solid understanding of their vision and how they see things unfold in front of them and how they react accordingly. I think Luke Getze is finally getting an understanding of the traits and the talents and the vision and the physicality of a guy like Khalil Herbert that you can play him in multiple in multiple ways within this offense. They got to worry about, I'm talking about the opposition, in this case the Giants, got to worry about Justin Fields when he gets out of the pocket and picking up rushing yards. You got to worry about those fly sweeps. You got to worry about Herbert. You got to worry about blasting game. Heck, but you're getting 6.76 yards on first down run of the football. It's second best in the National Football League behind Nick Chubb and the Cleveland Browns. How significant is that? How can you build on that? And how can the passing game develop because of that? First of all, don't shy away from it. If that's where you have coming into New York, then continue that process. Make the defensive coordinator, defensive personnel adjust to you. And then as soon as they start saying, okay, we're committing to stop the run, we're going to have eight guys up in the box, no doubt about it. And then you use Justin's athleticism, get outside the box, identify that receiver immediately. Like he said last week, you got to be willing to take checkdowns and turn those three-yard completions into 10-yard plays. So, yeah, they are going to identify what your best asset is offensively, and that's running the ball. And they're going to try to figure a way how to confuse you at the line of scrimmage and make more guys have individual assignments. For the second week in a row at Hallis Hall during his Thursday news conference, Luke Getze asked right out of the gate what his confidence level is, trust in Justin Fields. We do whatever we have to do to win games. So we've opened up the passing game. It's not like we haven't called pass plays that we were – or that we've been intimidated to call a play by any means. We're calling the game the way we feel is best to attack with our matchups. So it doesn't just – it's not – uh, you know, the, the perspective is that everything is just because it's through Justin, but we have 10 other guys that we have to account for too. So, you know, sometimes we aren't able to go five wide and spread people out uh, because of matchups that we have to deal with. So that goes into a lot of things. So uh, as we go through the games, we just got to find a be- our way to uh, take advantage of the matchups that we feel really good about and s- kind of stay away from those matchups that we maybe, maybe we don't feel so good about. My concern is to me, is when you get into a passing down, what are they going to do with that safety? So the safety last week for Houston, he, he kind of was a spy against Justin. And if Justin wanted to run, the safety would chase him. If the Justin did not want to run and he, he was going to throw the ball, then he was dropping back into trying to get into a confusing coverage lane. So to me, Jeff, it's all about how does the safety factor in an individual battle, an eye battle against Justin. And that would be Xavier McKinney and Julian Love out of Nazareth High School here in the Chicago area. When we come back, we'll be joined by veteran offensive lineman Lucas Patrick. This is Bears All Access. It's brought to you by IGS Energy on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Welcome back to Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy. Choose clean energy for your home at IGS.com because every good choice adds up to a better world. With Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak, joined by Bears offensive lineman Lucas Patrick. Good to see you. Welcome to the show. And how about this? Giants, how about this? Two teams with new regimes, new coaches. One of these two teams got to come out of this. Firing overtime, of course, at 3-1. and one. That, that puts a smile on your face, right? Because no one really had these kind of expectations outside looking in anyway. Yeah, um, I mean, I know... Uh inside the building we uh, see our team differently and and we have certain standards that we hold ourselves to but um you know i've been in the league long enough and you start to look at the league as kind of its own game um the regular season kind of has four quarters now i know we have 17 games so that math doesn't really add up but uh, if you can win each quarter it sets you up for um, a nice shot at the playoffs so uh, three and one would be huge and you come from a program that's been super successful when you, when you came from college and then you went to the Green Bay Packers, was that kind of feeling that you're talking about right there taught to you by the other players? Was it taught to you by management? And was the expectations high because of the success you were having? Um, a little bit of everything. Um, I think uh, whenever you can get a player-led team and, and Coach Flues is – uh, really big on on us kind of setting the tone and and taking care of things but um when the older guys can kind of instill in the younger guys or, or vice versa but like hey this is our standard and it's to win this quarter you know the first four games and then set ourselves up so that you know because you never know what uh what game you win early in the year can help with seeding and um yeah it's just it's something that I kind of got indoctrinated to uh early on in my career and I, I firmly believe in it that um 
you can't you can't look at the NFL season as a you know a big mountain you know huge task because winning the Super Bowl is the hardest thing you ever do. Um, you have to go week in week out, and each week the price becomes a little greater. Um, so you got to segment them, break them up, and, and really attack it one week at a time, and kind of compartmentalize the season. Um, what I like to do is into into four quarters and, and try and win each quarter because that's you know it's kind of how we try to win the games is go a drive at a time and you know win a quarter at a time. Lucas Patrick, our guest here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio six seventy. The score, healthy and ready to go. Uh, it had to tear your heart out a little bit uh, because you were brought here for a very specific reason to help you know not only uh, take the next step in your career but but get this uh, offense a- acquainted with the scheme and so forth. And then the injury to the hand pops up. I'm sure, given your route here to the National Football League, never easy to deal with something like that because uh, again, you had a new platform. And uh, you had to be sidelined a bit. But now you're back and it's, it's all over. But mentally, how did you handle all that? You know, you think it's going to be easier each time you, you get an obstacle and something comes your way, and, um, but it's not. Because each, each obstacle has different uh, parameters to it. Um, and this one was unique in the sense that um, I felt as if I had a bigger role here, um, was brought in for a purpose, and I feel like um, sometimes, you know, when you're just watching your guys practice and grind through camp, you're not fulfilling your purpose. Um, and so it's tough. You gotta, you gotta do a few gut checks and, and rely on, you know, teammates like, uh, Cody's been, uh, exceptional through this and been a great teammate and, uh, somebody like Sam, who's, uh, you know, taking the challenge and, and run full steam with it and super proud of what he's done. And, um, so I have some good guys around me, but it, it's tough. But you just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other and uh, take everything with a little bit of uh, grace and gratitude and just know that you're in a certain situation. You know, one similarity we do have, when I came out of college, I was kind of a center guard, guard center combination, and I was going to play wherever they needed me most. And I, But I always had a preference of playing guard. That's where I felt my most football confidence do you have a preference of where you play? Do you have the football confidence that, that I had? And um, what do you, like, what position do you favor? I think without, like, giving away any scheme stuff, I, I definitely prefer one position, and I think you could probably guess which position it is. Uh, it's a position I was assigned to a team to play. I just enjoy the battle of that, the mental and the physical. At the end of the day, the opportunity to play in the NFL is so short, and I saw that early in my career, uh, which I look at as a, great learning lesson that I don't want to be back out of the league. So if they need me to play anything, I'll I'll give them everything I got. Well, Jeff mentioned it before about the practice. We were at the practice when you, you got hurt. Did you know immediately? Cause I remember you, you ran your, you ran your play, you turned around, walked back to the group of guys and it seemed like you recognized something. Did you know immediately that you had tweaked something? Yeah. Unfortunately I've had, um, previous, uh, hand injuries that required, uh, medical attention similar to that um just hoping it wasn't severe enough to remove me for a long time um but yeah i I knew right away lucas patrick our guest here on chicago sports radio 670 the score with top there jeff joniak getting you ready for bears and giants one thing no matter what position or what your situation might be you bring unbelievable enthusiasm you always catch you doing something you're the life of the party on the football field and i'm sure you're pretty um Pretty significant in the weight room, too, in terms of motivating and however you go about doing it. Is this who this uh, native Tennesseeing always has been, or have you grown into this personality? Definitely early on in my career, I was uh, uh, be seen and not heard. And I think it's just as you get older, you get more comfortable and you know what to expect through the season. Um, but one thing that I love about our coaches is they, they let us be ourselves. And I learned that from a previous staff, and this staff is amazing at that, and especially um, – Simo's probably Chris Morgan, our offensive line coach. We all call him Simo. Um, he is so he's so good at balancing personalities, but also like getting us to work, and it just makes it fun. Like we're playing a kids' game. Oh way, yeah, way too much money to play a kids' game. Like let's go out and have fun. Like let's win games. Let's play hard. Let's like do what we need to do, but let's have fun. And um, you know, only get to do this for a certain you know limited years. You know because the NFL tends to tell you bye before we want to say bye. So 
I'm going to have as much fun every day as I can. You know, that was a veteran move right there. Uh, Tom now, is he's, he's worked at the mic more than he has in the trenches in his great career, but did you notice the veteran move right there? Because not everybody listening knows who Simo is, but he did a reset there. That's a veteran move by Lucas Patrick. I, I like it. Tell the audience who Simo is, Chris Morgan, and getting to know him is just something. Uh, really impressed by his attitude, number one. I know Tommy's got plenty of comments also to make um, – about Simo, so I'll let him do that as well. But w- what have you taken from him that really sets him apart, maybe from others that you've worked with over the course of your career? And just he's working with a, a really interesting group of guys. He's got the two vets, and he's got a bunch of young guys trying to get on this, uh, get this thing going. I think uh, one of the best attributes that Simo has is, um, like I said, letting us be us, but like working. But Sometimes you can look like you're working, but not be working efficient. And that kind of was an epiphany early on in the spring because I've always, like, it's kind of been my career. Like, I've had to work as hard as I can at everything and exhaust myself. But his biggest thing is, like, you don't have to exhaust yourself. If you're smarter, you know what they're going to do. Like, let's study. Like, you should know exactly what they're going to do before they do it so that you can beat them to it. And then you can play even harder and make it through the 75 snaps and just that mentality of like being a a maniac about the details and not not that I haven't been detailed before but that's that's what coaching is it's making your you know your better your best and keep keep climbing and keep improving and and he's really good at improving you know a guy like me a seven-year vet and improving a first-year player in Braxton and uh, you know, even second year players like I think Tevin Jenkins has made one of the greatest jumps from a tackle to a guard and he's playing really good ball right now and um yeah, Simo's able to handle all all of that in one room. I, I like the little uh, details that he pays attention to in offensive line play. Just a small thing, for example, if you're going to have a double team block, you guys both have to hit the defensive player, don't have any contact with each other. And that was one of the things that frustrates me around the league when you see an offensive mm-hmm. lineman bumping another offensive lineman off the block. So, you know, I really, you know, um, Lucas, as I was watching the speed in which you guys were practicing at throughout OTAs, and I was going, I don't, I think in my career and my time with the Bears player now as a broadcaster, I don't think I've ever seen the tempo in, in OTAs like I saw you. And I was going, I wonder if this is going to carry over to full pads. And it did. So my question is, did it surprise you at the tempo in which you guys were practicing at, number one? And number two, when Matt Eberflus was introduced as the head coach and he came up and he said, these guys better have their running shoes on. Did the running shoes part sit well with you? And did the tempo of OTA set well with you? Yeah. I mean, I've always thought I was in good shape, but this is a different shape. And it's not that I ever played in a bad shape. It's just, this is a different style of working. And, um, it's good. I mean, we firmly believe if we get a team in a close battle in the fourth quarter, they didn't work like us. And like I can say it because I have, I have never ran like I've run here before. I have never drilled like I've drilled here before. And when we get in the fourth quarter, I feel fresher than I've ever felt before with, you know, six years prior of being in the NFL. So um, it's definitely worth it. But, like, it's it's eye-opening. Like, you gotta you got to bring your lunch pail literally every day because nothing is given from – Coach Flus or Simo, and I love it because it it we have an edge. Like we believe the fourth quarter is ours. And uh, right now, defense believes that too. They have a lot of touchdown in the fourth quarter. Let's hope it continues in East Rutherford against the Giants. That is Lucas Patrick. I'm Jeff Joniak with Tom Thayer. We'll take our first break here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com to request an appointment in clinic or virtually and start feeling better tomorrow. With Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak, and Lucas Patrick, our guest for one more segment here on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score we're brought to you by IGS Energy. Tommy? You know, when you see the development of an offensive line, it's kind of unique in that the fact that it's kind of a team within a team. And, and like I said, I really enjoy what I've seen out of Chris Morgan and how he's coached everybody and coached guys at multiple positions. 
as an offensive lineman, when did you start seeing this thing come together going, okay, I'm getting an understanding that we're going to be a solid group and we're going to be a, a really powerful offensive line. You know, it's not to give you the coach or the player answer, the football answer, but like, I just, I guess, cause I'm in the weeds of it. I still feel like we have so far to go, but the only times you can kind of barely bear. And I'm talking barely look up and peek around is after games. When you look at rushing yards and we got to get better in protection. Um, it's one thing that, you know, we're working on uh, with our fundamentals, but uh, we're doing some special things up front and um, kind of have to rely on the fact that, this is what we wanted to do from the beginning. This is the goal we set out in OTAs when we had our first meeting about being a special group, being being tight, having a brotherhood, you know, not not being vets and rookies, but being older brothers and little brothers and, and really looking out for each other because at the end of the day, the, the, the five guys that are out there have to play as one. And when we get to play as one, everyone plays better. And when we play better, the team plays better. And it's – it's just kind of the mentality we have to have. You know, our offensive line coach always used to tell us, if you win the game, you're not going to get any credit. If you lose the game, you're going to get all the blame. Yep. So I guess generation to generation, that, that's the way it goes. I'd like to ask you a little bit about the emotions from week one to week two. So week one, you come out, you soldier feel, you get the introduction, you got a super supportive crowd. And it's a weather that I haven't seen three or four times in my life. Um, and so I'd like to capture the emotions of that game and then the emotions of week two going to Green Bay because in my, I mean, I've played, played in Green Bay a number of times. And to, to me, as never being a Packer, but being a Bear, I know what the emotions are of that game. So week one as a Bear and week two as a Bear going into Green Bay. Uh, week one as a Bear was a little more emotional for me personally, just um, – you know, my journey through the NFL and then signing here and and post-injury and, like, knowing I was going to get snaps, didn't know when those would come, and then uh, finally playing, and then in this crazy back-and-forth just slugfest, it felt like, against a really good Niners team. I mean, that's, you know, the last three to four years, that's been the consistency in the NFC has been the Niners. They've been, what, two or three Super Bowls? Uh, they haven't won one yet, but um, – couple NFC championships and I mean that's that's been kind of the NFC standard so to, to go toe to toe with them um felt great and I think it I think it gave us a lot of confidence in our process and belief in our system and what we're building here because anything worth building is going to be hard like there's going to be some really tough days and there were some tough days in the spring the summer and fall camp but, like, that was kind of a thing to say, like, hey, you're on the right track. It's not perfect, but, like, let's keep going. And then to segue into week two, um, just personally going back, you know, spending six years in a in that building and, and with that staff and certain players that are still there when I was there. And um, it was definitely uh, emotional for a different reason because I felt a lot of gratitude, uh, an appreciation for a place that um, allowed me an opportunity to now – be a bear and come back. Um, you know, there's plenty of staff. I know there's plenty of staff kids. I know there's players and even some of the players kids that I know. Um, so it was good to see some faces and get some hugs and, and see all that. But then, uh, the loss stung. Like I, when we were going down in that fourth quarter drive to go, what was it like 90, 87 yards? I think was how long we were 88. Um, I was convinced we were going to win that game because we were going to score, especially as that thing was going. Uh, we were going to get the ball back. Like, I knew we would. Um, but, you know, that's another top team in our division. Like, it is what it is. You got to win your division if you want to know you're going to the playoffs. And I think um, to go, again, toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and, you know, one bounce goes our way on a call on a goal line, and that's a completely different ball game, and that's, you know, a completely different storyline. Lucas Patrick, our guest. Okay, so I don't know if I wrote this or somebody wrote this about you. All I know is the affable Teddy Bearish Tennesseeing. It starts with that. You know, you parlayed a tryout at a rookie camp in Green Bay, and that's why you're here right now. Uh, you worked your way through the practice squad. You got opportunities in your first three years, but in a reserve role, and then you get to be a starter, mm -hmm. battled some injuries. 
when you look at the entire way you got here, how much do you respect that journey? And who do you thank for that? Um, wow. I mean, that's a deep, heavy question. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people I have to thank. Um, I mean, first is my Lord and Savior. Like, I, I would not be the man I am today if it weren't for knowing the unconditional love and person that I am in my faith. Um, that's like one of my core beliefs and allows me to, I think, be so comfortable around people and be myself and trust that I'm like, I'm good enough. Cause if I'm good enough in God's eyes, then I'm good enough in anyone's eyes. Um, but when I look back and look at this journey, it's, it's one of like, I've always said when I leave the NFL, whenever I'm told or whenever hopefully I get to choose is that everyone can say I was a good teammate. Like that's, and most guys who play, like if, if you say, man, that was a good teammate, that's such a short compliment, but a very, like there's a lot of depth in that. Um, so that's what I've tried to do pretty much since getting in the pros is just, be who I am, work hard, you know, be on time, do the small things right, uh, celebrate the big things, move on from the bad things as quickly as I can. Um, yeah, I mean, be open, like be open and honest with teammates. Um, I think sometimes guys are afraid to share their personality or really show who they are or uh, be themselves. And so, but also being, a good teammate sometimes, yeah, you have fun with them, but sometimes you got to be tough on them too, right? And right. I, I think you can you can pull that off pretty good. Yeah, I mean, um, a, a, a good teammate or a good coworker in any function of a team or business, like there's going to be tough conversations and there's going to be hard days, and you need people who look you in the face, say that wasn't good enough, or you know, you just weren't prepared, or like to get you better because we don't have time for you know we've got seven days in between each game, we don't have time to uh, sit and worry about feelings sometimes about, hey. like Hey, look, don't be so gosh darn sensitive. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like I know I'll speak frankly about myself last week. That wasn't good enough. Like I can't give up a sack like that. It was bad technique, poor. I was, I was seeing too much, but that wasn't good enough. And I've had that conversation with a few guys I was in with and, and told them like, hey, that won't happen or I'll try everything I can to not let it happen again. Like that's – being real and like being real uh is what we need all right we'll let you go here uh we're brought to you by igs energy this is bears all access with lucas patrick uh quick scouting report on what you're seeing from that front of the new york giants um talent i mean you know they got a lot of high draft picks they got a lot of size um they've got a lot of speed too when they go in their uh, sub packages and and they present a lot of issues to uh your base rules so you really got to understand um who's in the game, and how they're trying to attack you so that you can respond well. Well, good luck on Sunday. We'll be looking forward to it. It's a traditional battle, man. Bears and Giants, two of the uh, family-run organizations, when they get together, it's always a lot of fun. So it should be fun. And it looks like teams are just going to run the ball. Yeah. It's good old-fashioned football. Yeah. Exactly what way we like it, right? Yeah. That's Tom there. I'm Jeff Joniak. Thank you, Lucas Patrick. Appreciate your time. Thank you all. You're never gonna forget those sacks, no matter how old you get, dude. Because I can tell you, I can tell you right now, three of the worst sacks I ever gave up. And I, every time I you talk about football, you'll always remember them. Oh, uh, and it's and it's a good thing. It's part of the growth process. I appreciate what you've done, and thanks for coming on. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it too. Coming up next, we get a Giants point of view from their veteran play-by-play man, Bob Papa. It's all ahead here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by CDW. People to get it with Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak. We're breaking down Bears Giants week four upon us already, and we're hitting the road. In fact, the Bears are hitting the road six out of nine weeks. It's going to be quite the journey, quite the chunk of the season. First stop, though, MetLife Stadium in Jersey. Pleased to be joined by the veteran voice of the New York Giants, the multi-talented Bob Papa. So where are they at right now with the new regime, Brian Dayball? After this week, one of these two teams are going to be a surprising 3-1. and one. Yeah, I know that that's a shocker. Uh, there's a definite definitive swing within the building and the organization of they have broken from their past. Giants have always run a certain way. General manager with the authority, the head coach, and the way the whole thing unfolds. They realize that these sort of 
half-baked rebuilds weren't working and uh, they decided to sort of sweep it all clean. And thus they bring in Joe Shane from Buffalo to be the new general manager. He brings in Brandon Brown, who's a young rising star as an assistant GM. They got him from the Eagles. And then Brian Dable comes in. And even though he learned a lot under the Patriot way, uh, he's been a guy that's been to a lot of different places. And what they've put together is a collaboration now of people. There are people within the front office, personnel side, college side, coaching side, that have all come from various places that haven't always, they're not all connected, put it that way. So it's more of a think tank, fresh ideas. And uh, I think it's really energized everybody within the building. I'm not a big fan of analytics, but sometimes it's hard to ignore numbers during the course of the season. So you look at the Bears and the Giants statistically, and there's very similar numbers on both sides. You, you double us in the amount of pass yards, and uh, you're better, you're 20 yards better against the rush. But then on the percentage side, it gives the Giants a 66% chance for them to beat the Bears. Is it home field advantage? Is it crowd noise support? What is the two-thirds advantage for the Giants that they have over the Bears? Uh, I think, first of all, it's a little, little bit of is the home field component of it. Although the Giants, you know, since the start of 2017 are a whopping 13 and 29 in MetLife Stadium. Uh, Thanks so for that like nugget, gonna, by the way. I appreciate not, it. I'll be like using that gonna, one. It's not like it's been a house of horrors for teams coming in. Uh, I think there's just a different energy about this Giants team. They play hard. Uh, Brian Dable told Carl Banks and I on the field before the game last week, Monday night, he said, look, we know that we don't have a chance to draw Picasso's every week. Uh, we don't have a chance to be the prettiest girl. We're not going to draw the prettiest picture. The way our team is right now in this maturation and turnover of the roster can we hang in there and fight, fight, fight and get this game into the fourth quarter and take the opponent into the deep waters and then see where the chips fall? And the team is bought into that mentality, which is why they were able to figure out a way to win in Tennessee and figure out a way to win against Carolina in week one. And in the Cowboys game, you know, they had the lead in the game. They had opportunities late in the game. They weren't good enough to make the plays, but the philosophy is if we could just hang in there we're going to be good enough and play smart enough to steal some games that maybe in the past they haven't. You know, when they hired Matt Eberflus, he came in, and I'm not saying single-handedly, but a lot of his preaching and a lot of his messages to the team has really been accepted. And he's a big responsibility for the change of culture in this building so immediately. Is Dayball the same? Has he changed the culture that much? Uh, he's just a real person. Uh, he takes time going into the cafeteria at lunch and uh, he'll go in there and sit, not just with the football people. Sometimes he'll sit with a group of marketing people. Sometimes he'll sit with a group of people in the season ticket sales office or PR or broadcasting <clears throat> just to get to know them because he feels like every, he says every single person that works in this building has value to the team. Um, and I want them to know that I feel that way about them. And so he bring, he's really good at team building. He's really good at being authentic. Um, perfect example. Some, so much was made about um, Kadarius Tony only playing a couple snaps in week one, seven. Kenny Galladay played two the following week against Carolina. He told those guys up front during the week, probably not fit, fitting into this game plan this week for whatever the reasons are, but he was honest. And he wasn't trying to BS. And he, the other thing that I've noticed about him is he's not trying to act like how a head coach should act. He's acting like Brian Dable. And if you talk to anybody who knows Brian Dable for a long period of time, they say he's like the same guy. He came from nothing. He was raised by his grandparents, um, you know, in, in Canada, in the Toronto area or in the Buffalo area. And um, he's just like, there's no airs about him, but he also has drawn a line of where he's the coach and he's not the buddy. And I think everybody respects his honesty and him not trying to say, okay, now I'm a head coach of a football team. I got to act like this because this is how head coaches are supposed to act.
Bob Papa, our guest here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Jeff and Tom with you. Neither of them are calm plays, am I correct? I mean, I know Eberflus isn't. Is Dable? No, no, no. And I thought that was a really smart move by Dable because, you know, it's not easy to give that. That's how you got the job, right? You're yep. really good at that. That's what got you in this position to get the job. Now, suddenly I'm going to give that up. But he looked at the big picture and uh, he had a lot of respect for Mike Kafka and what he's done in Kansas City and his reputation, and he can't, he gave it a he gave it a walkthrough during during training camp and through the preseason games to see how it would go. And he told us so many times during before our TV production meetings uh, during the preseason, he goes, "Man, he goes, I don't know what to do with myself in the morning because when I'm calling plays, you know, I have a, I had my whole routine. I'm going because I'm just walking around, not really knowing what to do with myself." But it's all good. You know, obviously he shares in some of the things that go on during the course of the game, but he's he's letting Kafka run with it. You know, to me, I think Saquon Barkley is a running back that is like league wide. I think everybody, when he got injured, was pulling for him to get back into the type of guy that we are introduced to early in his career. Number one, is is he back to 100%? And number two, is he the biggest offensive influence on your team? Oh, without a doubt, as far as influence. Um, yeah, Barkley, last year, you could see that he was still feeling his way back. In fact, the only game last season he had of 70 or more rushing yards was the one against the Bears, in which he went for 102. This year, uh, he's over 70-plus rushing in every game. We saw it in training camp. We saw that burst that quickness, elusiveness that we hadn't really seen last year. The other thing that we saw to Saquon, the other thing that this is coaching, these guys have stressed in Saquon Barkley, sometimes you got to just take the dirty two, the (laughs) dirty two or the dirty three. And Barkley has bought in. And if you look at him compared to what he was doing in the past, there's much less dancing. There's much less looking to try to find the home run. And he takes the dirty two and the dirty three, which eventually leads to the 68-yard run. You think about the game in Tennessee against the Titans in week one. He wasn't doing that much. But you know what? He wasn't trying to bounce it outside and look for the home run ball. He was just sticking it in there, sticking it in there, and eventually the defense cracked. Same thing happened last week against the Cowboys. A lot of dirty twos, a lot of ugly runs, but not negative plays. Not the loss of four, two. Three, keep you in manageable down in the distance, and then he cracks one for 36 for a touchdown. That's music to the ears of your guy right here, Tom Thayer. He'll take the dirty two, he'll take three, he'll take three and a half, he'll take whatever. And it's a stunning number of rushing yards last week by the Bears at 281. I was thinking they were going to pop like 350 at, at one point. But both teams are running it, and both teams are giving up some yards on the ground. So uh, is this a trench game, Bob, to wrap us up? Yeah, it definitely is a trench game. Um, To me, it doesn't matter if it's the Bears were born in 1920, the Giants were born in 1925. (laughs) And we could talk about all the different schemes that have come into the sport and whether it's the run and shoot, the spread, the K-gun, all these different offenses, ground and pound, everything else. One thing hasn't changed since 1920. If you don't win at the point of attack, you do not win. It doesn't matter what schemes. I don't care how creative... These guys are, if you can't block them and you can't stop them, you're not going to win the football game. And, you know, Leonard Williams being out last week killed the Giants. He's, he's a Pro Bowl caliber player. But then when I looked at the coach's tape, the defensive line wasn't as bad as it looked at first blush. It was the inside backers who they, let's say, they don't have elite inside backers. Um Tay Crowder and Austin Calitro are not elite inside backers. And those guys were running out of holes. Uh, gap integrity was terrible. Um, they have to be better. And looking at the Bears, they have to be able to stop the run because it is about the trenches in this football game. This is not this is going to be a low-scoring game. And if you can stop the run, you're going to have a great chance to win, especially with the Giants hurting at the receiving core. I'm going to give you one stat from my little note card. I'm starting to prep it for the game. <laughs> The New York Giants have not scored a touchdown in the first half, not the first quarter, in the first half of their last seven games. Oh, my goodness. The last first half touchdown they scored was on December the 12th in Los Angeles against the Chargers. The legendary Mike Glennon with a three-yard touchdown pass to fullback (laughs) Eli Penny 
is the last time that the Giants have scored a touchdown in the first half of a game. Well, it's almost impossible in the NFL. Right. And the Bears haven't given up a touchdown in the second half so far this year, so something may have to give. Hopefully, uh, from a Bears perspective, we'll keep that streak going for you, Bob. <laughs> Shut out, yeah. touchdown in the first half. Uh, you know, it's amazing. We just did 13 and a half minutes in this quarterback era. We never mentioned Daniel Jones or Justin Fields. Well, That's interesting, way, just, isn't it? Just, I'm going to give you some words from Brian Dable. The game against Carolina, he, Jones got ripped on social media by the ESPN guys are for his eyes, not seeing guys that appeared to be open. I asked Dable about it the day after the game. I said, he goes, you sound like my wife. Because <laughs> you sound like my wife. He's like, Daniel played one of the smartest games ever. He goes, you know some of those guys that were running wide open? They weren't in his, in his progressions. So he wasn't cutting it loose at them because they were where they were. They were, they were running routes that weren't even part of the play. So how does he know to cut it loose? Are they going to stop? Are they going to keep going? Are they running a sale route? I, Daniel doesn't know. He said he played one of the most intelligent games that he's seen a quarterback play. And then what the way he played on Monday night was as tough a game as you're going to see a guy play and delivered plays under pressure. So um, they're very excited about what Jones has done so far. I don't know if he's the future, but I know for certain he's he's playing the game much better than the outside public media and fan base think he's playing the game. Yeah. And only a coach could tell you that. All right, we're going to let you go. Appreciate the time as always, and we will see you Sunday in Jersey. Looking forward to seeing you in the booth. Yes, sir. Thank you, Bob. The great Thanks, Bob guys. Papa and the New York Giants. Tom and I resume the show after a break here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Great seats available to see your Chicago Bears this season at Soldier Field. Get your tickets at chicagobears.com slash tickets. With Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak. Wrapping up our show in our final segment, Tom, we looked at offense in the first segment tonight. Interesting conversations with Lucas Patrick and the voice of the Giants, Bob Papa. Now let's look at the Bears' defense through your eyes. What do you see when you watch the tape of the Bears' defense that is, A, exciting for you to see how it continues to build, or if there's anything troublesome for you right now. And I think the run defense would be the focus on that. You know, I, I think Nicholas Morrow and Roquan Smith are understanding how to play alongside each other, how to commit to a point of attack, and then how to flow to the point of attack. They're being complemented by solid play up up in front. Uh, Blackson gets a tip ball that cre- results in an interception for Roquan. They got a variety of outside pass rushers that they can – just keep the offensive tackle off balance because he doesn't get a chance to continuously read one guy's stance. And I guess it's up to the defensive backs to complement the pass pressure. So to me, this week, when I look at a guy like Saquon Barkley, start low, stay low by the front eight. Because when you're going to tackle Saquon Barkley, you better be in a perfect tackling position. Eddie Jackson, the Bears starting safety on high alert about Saquon Barkley. He has the ability to take the ball, you know, 80 yards, 100 yards, whatever. So us, we just got to be on our keys. When we rerun, we got to come, make sure we crowd the line, give them less space uh, as possible in open field, um, you know, make the tackles, you know, easier on ourselves, you know, when the ball starts to hit, you know, the second level of the defense. And, you know, he's healthy, he's thick-thighed, he's fast, he's big, he can pass, uh, catch as well as anybody, and uh, definitely can hit the rails and burn you. His speed is always going to be a challenge to every defense that he plays against. And you probably know at the 40 time of Daniel Jones from the combine. I don't. But Saquon's speed, you have to respect. Daniel Jones' speed, you can't let beat you. So when Eddie Jackson's talking about what their responsibility is, his is from back to front. So make sure that you keep Saquon in front of you. And like I said, don't be looking to strip the ball. Look to tackle. Four three seven for Barkley. Four eight one for Daniel Jones. But he can scamper now. He's got thirteen rushing first downs this year. Well, I know that no one would know that off the top of their. <laughs> you, but I'm just saying four three. You respect four eight. Don't let beat you. Alan Williams on Barkley. It's uh, hammer the rock, hammer the rock, hammer the rock, and then big play. He finds a gap. Someone that's peeking backside. It could be the nose or. Uh, it's uh, he's going outside, and it may be the defensive end that's uh, that's peeking inside for whatever reason. He's on the edge, and you know, going for thirty or forty. So, um, yeah, he he is a he's a scary guy in terms of uh, his home run ability. So it's an interesting name game here: Roquan versus Saquon, Jaquan 
the Bears' safety, Jaquan Brisker, also against Saquon. They're going to meet. These three guys, it's almost a triangle of trouble there, both for Saquon and for the for the uh, Bears, because those two guys in the safety may be involved here if he's in the box. Well, you know, Q, third, Q is a third letter in their names, you know. How <laughs> often does that happen? Not often. Uh, Roquan, by the way, going to be more position, according to Matt Eberflus, the further he gets deeper into this defense, to be in a position to make big plays. You know, he's uh, growing in the defense. Uh, he's understanding where he fits in the defense. You know, and I said it last night, you know, he, he's coming from a 3-4, you know, so it's a little bit more lateral. Um, it's a little more take on. And this is more run, you know. It's more run. It's more speed. It's more playing, you know. Uh, um, you know, in front of the in front of the linemen in front of that are penetrating. And you have to learn how to do that. And I think he's learning uh, as as he goes. He's getting more comfortable in that position for sure. Yeah, you, I mean, you look at these tackles for a loss just from this Houston game, and you look at what the defensive line was doing up in front of them. And when Matt Eberflus talks about the freedom of these linebackers to run, read, and penetrate, it's because you either got a guy like Justin Jones that's making immediate penetration and he's getting the entire playoff balance, or you got those guys on the inside taking multiple blockers to allow the speed of Roquan and Nicholas Morrow to take over. All right, I go back to the tape watching. And so it's three weeks now. You, you start to develop some tendencies and you start to see things that doesn't mean they're going to – uh, show that exactly, but this was interesting this week. I don't know if you heard Alan Williams discuss uh, how the idea is to be difficult to scout. If you're good at what you do, you have tendencies. Uh, good teams have have big time tendencies, and I would hope that uh, when people look at us, they would say, "Hey, we kind of know what they're doing, but they execute their stuff so well that we can't we can't stop them. That they play at such a speed, at such a rate, at such a veracity." Uh, that they can't be stopped. So I'm more, that's more important to me than saying that, gosh, they do everything. Uh, we want to do something well at the end of the day. We want to say that when people come and look at the, or they look at the tape, I want them to say, wow, did they speed the tape up? Is that the speed of, you know, the, the tape? Or are, are they really playing that fast and that precise and that consistency? That Those are the words I, I want people to use, not just, they do a lot of stuff. Hey, listen, 85, 86 Bears, you get the two, the 2000 era Ray Lewis, Baltimore Ravens. There's things that they can do so good, no matter what you try to do, you can't block them. And, on, you know, that's the thing about the process of playing in the NFL. When we played against, when Buddy Ryan went to Philly and he had the Reggie White, then you look at that defensive personnel group, sometimes they're so good that, you know, their ability outweighs tendencies. This has been Bears All Access. It's been brought to you by IGS Energy here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. And calling all Bears fans, get the ultimate VIP fan package with Chicago Bears VIP. Secure a game ticket and appearance from Bears legends and more by visiting chicagobearsvip.com. That's going to do it for us. For Tom Thayer, Lucas Patrick, and Bob Popeye, I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks to everybody listening and thanks to our producers tonight. Have a great night. This has been Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score.